Previously, I talked about heat capacity from thermal energy and thermal energy arising from phonons. Now, I wish to review and discuss about phonon dispersion curve. You remember we derive the omega as a function of k or the omega versus k plot when we studied the monoatomic chain and diatomic chain. The phonon dispersion relation that is the omega as a function of k shows new features in crystals with two or more atoms per basis. Consider the sodium chloride and diamond that possess two atoms per primitive cell. For each polarization mode, the frequency versus wave vector develops two branches which are the acoustical branch and the optical branch. We have longitudinal acoustical or LA and transverse acoustical or TA. We also have longitudinal optical or LO and transverse optical or TO. If there are p number of atoms in a primitive cell, then there will be three p branches to the dispersion relation, specifically three acoustical and 3p minus 3 optical. As an example, consider germanium and uh, potassium bromide. Both have two atoms per primitive cell. This results to six branches. In particular, three acoustical and three optical branches to the dispersion relation. In the plot, we see one LA or longitudinal acoustical and two transverse acoustical. We also observe one longitudinal optical and two transverse optical. The two transverse acoustical TA phonons are horizontal at the zone boundary. What is a phonon? The quantum of vibration is called a phonon. It is analogous to the photon which is the quantum of an electromagnetic wave. A normal mode of frequency is given by the equation for standing waves. The atomic displacements are also expressed as standing waves. That's the equation U equals amplitude A times exponential term E to the IKX minus omega T. A mode is occupied by n phonons of energy h bar omega and momentum h bar k. Density of states is an important characteristic of lattice vibrations. It is related to the wave dispersion or omega as a function of k. For the case of isotropic solid, we obtain the following equation n of omega. What is meant by isotropic? Isotropic means that the vibrational frequency of the solid does not depend on the direction of the wave vector k. The heat capacity is the derivative of the energy per mole with respect to the temperature at constant volume. In the equation shown, we see that the central problem is to find the density of states. Recall that in lattice vibrations, the kinds of modes are acoustical and optical modes. In the Debye model, the acoustic mode is assumed to be the dominant contributor to the heat capacity. Just like in an elastic continuum, the sound velocity is constant and independent of polarization. From the dispersion relation, we got wave frequency equals the product of sound velocity and wave vector. So the density of states in the Debye model is proportional to the volume and square of frequency and inversely proportional to the cube of sound velocity. To know the thermal energy and then the heat capacity, we should know the limits of the integral. 
the lower limit is zero, how about the upper limit? If there are n unit cells in the specimen, then the total number of acoustic phonon modes is n. We multiply by 3 to obtain the total energy from all polarizations. Moreover, a cut of frequency called the d by frequency is determined. This becomes the upper limit of the integral to get energy. The d by heat capacity is plotted below. In the high temperature limit, the heat capacity approaches the classical value of 3nk or 3r. In the opposite limit, the low temperature limit, the heat capacity is proportional to the cube of temperature. The T cube approximation is quite good at sufficiently low temperatures. This is explained in this way. At low temperatures, only the long wavelength acoustic modes are thermally excited. We already know that Einstein considered n oscillators of the same frequency and in one dimension. This time, we ascertain the density of states in the Einstein model. And we see that it contains a delta function at the frequency of oscillation. The thermal energy is as shown, then the heat capacity has the following form containing theta sub e over t. The high temperature limit becomes 3 and k sub b, which is known as the Dulong pt value. That's the 3r value right there. At low temperatures, the heat capacity decreases as exponent of negative theta sub e over t which is different from the d by t cube law. The reason for this is at low temperature, acoustic phonons are much more populated. How about the short wavelength optical modes? They have short wavelength, hence high energy. Short wavelength modes have too high an energy for them to be populated significantly at low temperatures. Again, the explanation is acoustic phonons are much more populated at low temperatures. Therefore, the d by model is a much better approximation than the Einstein model. The Einstein model is useful to approximate the optical phonon part of the phonon spectrum. Real density of vibrational states is much more complicated than what has been described by the Einstein model and Debye model. What is meant by that? Well, we have a plot here showing the density of states as a function of frequency. The dash curve represents the spectrum of a solid obeying the Debye model. The solid curve represents the actual crystal structure of copper. The Einstein approximation would give a delta peak at some value of frequency. The spectrum of the copper crystal starts as omega squared, as we notice. That's the parabola right there in the plot. But notice also the discontinuities develop at singular points. Now, the density of states must be taken into account to obtain quantitative description of such experimental data. The density of states n of omega is proportional to omega squared and inversely proportional to the sound velocity q. The points at which the group velocity or sound velocity is zero contribute to the density of states. We call these points critical points and they produce singularities. When we describe the temperature gradient in a material, we say that the heat flows from the hotter system to the colder system. I'm holding a mug of coffee, hot coffee, though the steam curling upward is no longer visible. Um, what happens when three ice cubes are placed on it? The ice melts into water. 
heat flows from the coffee to the ice. The resulting water is warmer while the coffee has become a tad colder. This coffee is not for me, by the way, but for my husband since I'm pregnant. The heat current density is also known as the flux of thermal energy. That is the energy transmitted across unit area per unit time. Moreover, the heat current density is proportional to the temperature gradient. The proportionality constant is the thermal conductivity. I like the description in Kittel's book, and it says, the process of thermal energy transfer is a random process. The energy does not simply enter one end of the specimen and proceed directly in a straight path to the other end, but it diffuses through the specimen, suffering frequent collisions. If C is the heat, and heat capacity of the single particle, then moving from a region of temperature T plus delta T to a region at temperature T, a particle will give up energy C delta T. Due to the random nature of conductivity, the temperature difference delta T between the ends of a free path of the particle is given by the above equation. Temperature gradient multiplied by the free path, which equals temperature gradient times average velocity times tau. Tau is the time between collisions. The net flux of energy is therefore J sub U equals negative one third times C times V times DT over DX. C is the heat capacity per unit volume V is still the average velocity, and L is the phonon mean free path. Therefore, the phonon thermal conductivity K is the product of the heat capacity per unit volume, and average velocity, and phonon mean free path. Alright, we know that the heat capacity has dependence on temperature. We covered that already. Now another concept is the mean free path that strongly depends on temperature. There are three important mechanisms. Letter A, collision of phonons with other phonons. Letter B, collision of a phonon with imperfections in the crystal. Letter C, collision of a phonon with the external boundaries of a crystal. The first one, phonon-phonon scattering, is due to the unharmonic interaction. What does this mean? We explain this by way of contrast with what is harmonic and what is the mean free path. If interatomic forces are purely harmonic, there is no way for collisions between phonons. The mean free path is limited by collision of phonon with crystal boundary and lattice imperfections. So the scenarios B and C pertain to harmonic interaction. Now about unharmonic interaction. At high temperatures, atomic displacements are large, which lead to stronger unharmonism. This is when coupling, okay, coupling between phonons occurs, and the mean free path is further limited. At these high temperatures, the mean free path L is inversely proportional to temperature T. We understand this relationship by the number of phonons with which a single phonon can interact. At high temperature, the number of excited phonons is proportional to the temperature. The collision frequency should be proportional to the number of phonons with which a given phonon can collide. Hence, the mean free path is proportional to the inverse of temperature. Now, let us say that 
two phonons with vectors k1 and k2 collide, producing another phonon with vector k3. I want to remark that I have no problem with that statement since it does not violate the law of causality. The third phonon is a result of the cause that is a two phonon collision. In terms of momentum conservation, vector K3 equals the sum of vectors K1 and K2. The only meaningful phonon wave vector K lies in the first Brillouin zone. The graphical representation of the momentum conservation I mentioned that involves the three vectors is the figure given. If K3 lies inside the first Brillouin zone, the momentum of the system before collision is the same as the momentum of the system after the collision. This is called normal process or N process and it does not affect the thermal resistivity. If K3 lies outside the first Brillouin zone, as the figure shows, we reduce K3 to its uh, equivalent inside the first Brillouin zone, and that is K3 plus the vector G. You recall the vector G is a reciprocal lattice vector. In this particular wave interaction process, the total wave vector change is not zero. It is equal to a reciprocal lattice vector. This is always possible in the periodic lattice. K3 is longer than the first Brillouin zone and it is brought back by the addition of a reciprocal lattice vector. This type of process is UMCLAP process or U process. This is highly efficient in changing the momentum of phonons. UMCLAP processes are responsible for phonon scattering at high temperatures. At this point, we are interested at low temperatures. At low temperatures, the UMCLAP process or the process involving phonon-phonon collision becomes ineffective in limiting thermal conductivity. The dimension of the specimen, on the other hand, is the factor. Okay, So the size effect becomes dominant as shown in the figure. Uh, the figure is for sodium fluoride crystal. At these low temperatures, the mean free path would be a constant and of the order of the diameter of the specimen. So the thermal conductivity is approximately the product of the heat capacity and the average velocity and diameter. Important to note class is that only the heat capacity has temperature dependence at such low temperatures. Earlier, I discussed in this video that at low temperatures, there are long wavelength phonons. Another interesting feature of these long wavelength phonons is that they are not effectively scattered by defects because defects are much smaller in size. Since the heat capacity varies as T cubed or temperature cubed, at low temperatures, we expect the thermal conductivity to vary as T cube as well at such low temperatures. Consider the graph again. We have an explanation now for the low temperature part or the left side part. Uh, how about the high temperature part? How do you explain the behavior of the graph? The answer was given a while ago. Uh, review the part to make sure that you follow. So far, there's a limitation to the theory of lattice vibration. That is, the potential energy has terms 
quadratic in the interatomic displacements x. The consequences of these are the following. Phonons do not interact, and then no thermal expansion, and then the heat capacity is constant at high temperature. To understand the thermal expansion, consider the effect of unharmonic terms in the potential energy. That means we have to consider the terms gx cubed and fx raised to the fourth power. The C, G, and F here are all positive numbers. And X is the displacement from equilibrium separation at absolute temperature. When considering thermal expansion, we have to calculate the average displacement using Boltzmann distribution function. This is the first equation shown here. Since the unharmonic terms are small, much less than KBT or the product of Boltzmann constant and temperature, then we can expand the unharmonic terms using Taylor expansion for exponent. We see this in the second equation where we let beta be equal to 1 over kbt. And then the integrals have the following values. So the average displacement is reduced to the expression 3 fourths times g over c cubed times kbt. We further remark that the origin of thermal expansion is the asymmetric potential. I've discussed the theory of lattice vibrations now, experimentally, one can probe lattice vibrations using techniques such as inelastic X-ray scattering, neutron scattering, infrared spectroscopy, and Brillouin and Raman scattering. In this slide, I'm going to briefly tackle inelastic X-ray scattering. The key word is inelastic, which implies that the kinetic energy is not conserve. The equation is given as h bar small omega at the left side, which is the energy of incident neutron. At the right side of the equation, we have h bar omega naught, which is the energy of the scattered neutron. The big omega times h bar is the phonon created or absorbed in the process. To visualize in terms of wave vectors, refer to the left side figure. By measuring the difference between wave frequency, we have an idea on energy gain or energy loss. What is important in this type of experiment? Experimentally, we can determine the wave dispersion big omega of Q. We do this by finding the frequency difference and the sine theta. Now, it's difficult to measure the energy gain or loss accurately, but this problem is surpassed through the use of neutron scattering because by the use of neutron scattering, the energy of thermal neutrons is comparable to around 80 MeV. Now, in this slide, it's about Brill 1 and Raman spectroscopy. Basically, you have inelastic light scattering mediated by the electronic polarizability of the medium. The material scatters radiant light from a source. If the scattered light is at the same wavelength as the laser source, we call it Rayleigh scattering. 
but if a small amount of light is scattered at different wavelengths, either longer wavelengths or shorter wavelengths, we call it Raman scattering. Now it's important to note that not every crystal lattice vibration can be probed by Raman scattering because of certain selection rules. Only small wave vector phonons are seen in the first order Raman spectra of bulk crystals. Selection rules are determined by crystal symmetry. So in summary, the phonon thermal conductivity is proportional to the heat capacity per mole, the average velocity, and the mean free path of the phonon. And there are three important mechanisms of phonon scattering that affect the thermal conductivity. We have the umclap processes of phonon-phonon collisions that occur at high temperatures, and we have the collision of a phonon with crystal defects and impurities, and we have the collision of a phonon with the external boundaries of the crystal, which play a role at low temperatures. The unharmonism of potential energy is responsible for phonon-phonon interaction and thermal expansion. And aside from the theory of lattice vibrations, we can probe lattice vibrations experimentally by inelastic X-ray scattering, neutron scattering, and Raman scattering.